Shemot, Exodus. We're going to be in chapter 40. The portion begins in 38, 21, Exodus 38, verse 21. Uh, the name of the portion is Pekudim, or is it Pekudai? Yeah, Pekudai. Um, but we're going to begin in chapter 40, actually. Um, the, name of, the name of the portion means the things that are numbered. Uh, we talked a, a little bit about this when we talked about the half shekel that everybody needed to bring uh, and how they were numbered. And so it's the same word here. But we're going to go to chapter 40. I'm going to begin there in verse 1. So Exodus 40, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Notice that I have the Hebrew translator aided now in a way that you can read it. And so that uh, is going to help us a little more. It helps us learn. You know, uh, the more and more that you see these words, then you, you become more familiar with them. Um, when we uh, learn more Hebrew, then we can take the translator, transliteration and add the Hebrew to it. And um, that'll, that'll make it more fun. All right, so verse 2. On the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. All right. I'm going to start out by talking to you about Christmas. <laughs> Christmas in March. You ever heard of that? <laughs> Christmas in March. All right. <laughs> Bear with me. Bear with me. Let me see. Let me look for a passage. Uh, let's see. Maybe I should look in here. In John chapter 1, we know that verse. I think it's, it's a verse 14 where it talks about that he came to tabernacle. Oh, no. He came to tabernacle among us. Let me see if it's verse 14. And the word became flesh. And dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as, the, as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, all right, so this verse, and the word became flesh and, the, and dwelt among us, in the Greek, it gives the, it, when, you, when you take the Greek and then take it back to the Hebrew in the Torah, then it turns out to be the word tabernacle. That he came in tabernacle among us. Because of that, people, and, and because of other, other reasons as well, they say, well, he was born on Sukkot, on the Feast of Tabernacles, because he came to tabernacle among us, right? I'm going to mess with that a little bit, if you've heard that. Because, back to Exodus 40, it says, on the first day of the first month, you set up the tabernacle. And what happens at the end of chapter 40? The glory of God came to the tabernacle. <laughs> so, this is a little picture of the incarnation. Of God coming to dwell with man. You realize that up to this point. It had been all the way back in the garden. All the way back to the garden. When God dwelled on earth with man. And ever since then. That had not happened. He will come and have encounters with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He came to the mountain with Moses. But it is now here in the tabernacle when he said, I'm going to dwell among you. Build me a tabernacle so that I can dwell among you. 
So this actually, it's a better, it's a better uh, connection to John 1. Because on the Feast of Tabernacles, those are temporary. Number one, they are temporary dwellings. And number two, they are not supposed to be a dwelling of God. The, the, the Sukkot that we build around Sukkot, they're not a tabernacle in the sense of God dwelling in, in it. It was the people of Israel who dwelled on those temporary shelters in the wilderness. So the picture really isn't quite complete if we think of the Son of God coming to dwell around Sukkot because that's it, the picture is not complete. Those Sukkot were not for the glory of God to dwell. But the tabernacle itself, that is where the glory of God came yes. to dwell. Yes. Amen. So the reference in John 1 that he came to tabernacle among us, it's, it actually is, it fits better with Exodus 40, where the glory of God comes to dwell in his tabernacle. So, if you have that, if you were to say, well, the Son of God came to dwell on earth on the same day that the glory of God came to dwell in the, in the tabernacle, then you had Christmas in Nisan, on Nisan. Because look at this, it says, on the first day of the first month. On the first day of the f that's Nisan. Mm -hmm. What would you do on the 14th day of the first month? Passover. Passover. So, on the first day of the first month, the glory of God came to dwell among us. That's a pretty good biblical reason to think that the incarnation, the birth of Yeshua actually took place the first of Nisan. There is, there is another confirmation of that that's also pretty strong. Because we know the shepherds were on the field, right? We know it because the nativity scene says that the shepherds were on the field. No, is that, no, that's not why. That's not why. <laughs> We know the scriptures, obviously. Uh, Matthew tells us the, the shepherds were on the field. Now, there is only one time in the year that the sheep enter into heat only one time a year. Only one time a year. If they all enter into that they're all born at the same time, right? Give or take a day or two, but, you know, it's going to be, going to be around the same time. And it is a well-known fact that it's called lambing, lambing season, where, when the lambs are born. It's a well-known fact that it happens in the spring, Pretty close to the first day of Nisan. So the shepherd wouldn't have been out on the field in the winter. Just they, they, there's no reason for them to be in, out in the field. The one time when the shepherds will be out in the field was when the lambs were born. That was the, the vulnerable time when they were did, uh, took watch overnight to, to care for the, to watch over the, the lambs. So naturally, they would have been out in the field around the same time when the lambs were born. And I think it would be um, rather um, inconsistent for the Lamb of God to not be born when the lambs were born. You follow what I'm saying? But this actually goes together. So the lambs, we're talking about Christmas if you just came in. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> all the Jews are all the Jews are ready to go. They're ready to get out of here. <laughs> it's like, oops, we came to the wrong building today. <laughs> and 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 um, Helen is still like, what, what what did you just say? <laughs> So we're talking about the season, number one, and I'll do a quick recap. We, we looked at John 1, 14, over on this side, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt goes back, to, when you take the Greek, you take it to the Hebrew, it goes back to tabernacle. He came to tabernacle among us. And so some people say that he was born on the Feast of Tabernacles, on Sukkot. Because the word tabernacles. But we said that the Sukkot, the tabernacles, were never a dwelling place for the glory of God. They were a place where the Israelites dwelt in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. But over in Exodus 40, which is our portion for today, it says that on the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle. And we know they set it up. And that day, the glory of God came to dwell on the tabernacle. So, John 1 actually is not a reference to Sukkot, but it's a reference to this, the glory of God coming to dwell in the tabernacle. So, the Son of God then, according to my little theory, right? The Son of God came to dwell with us, came to tabernacle with us the same day that the glory of God came to dwell in the tabernacle, not in the Sukkot, but in the tabernacle. So, sounds like it, it could hold water a little bit. Yes? It says, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. We look upon his glory and the glory of the one and only from the Father. So, yeah, reading the entire verse, it actually tells you this is talking about the glory of God. So, even more proof, right, even more proof that there, there is a connection there. And so then, secondly, we were saying that in the natural, the lambs, the, the sheep, only have one mating season. Mm -hmm. Only one mating season during the year, which means that all the little lambs are going to be born around the same time. And it is a well-known fact that lambing season, the season where the lambs are born, is in the spring, at the beginning of spring. That is the first day of the first month. That's the first day of Nisan. <laughs> now the Jews are giving me the thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> so this is Christmas on Nisan. Christmas in, in the spring. <laughs> Kind of dizzy now with all the Christmases, right? <laughs> so, there are other, other issues that we will need to address. But at least we, we've got here a couple of pretty powerful um, hints, clues, um, maybe even stronger than that. That, uh, that he was actually born on, on, on the first of Nisan. And uh, the first of the month, it's, it's a semi-appointed time. Every month on Rosh Chodesh, the first of the month, the first moon, the new moon, um, Special sacrifices were offered, and it was really a feast, not an unofficial kind of a feast. Not a Torah mandated, but it was, they, they observed that. You can read David. David, when he was um, running away from Saul, there was an occasion when David was missing because he thought that, that uh, Saul was going to kill him. And so Jonathan covered for him, and he said, well, he's unclean. Uh, so that's why he's not a... <laughs> Meaning he'd been, he'd been with women. So he's unclean. So he couldn't be here for the sacrifice because he's unclean. Because they would... And it was the occasion was the new moon. The new moon. So they were eating peace offerings. 
Um, so which tells you that they actually threw a party. They, they had a feast and it was actually two days. They did it for two days um, on New Moon. How much more so then on the first month, the first day of the first month, would it carry even more significance, right? And so we would expect that to be almost a holiday, the first day of the first month. But we don't say, we, the Torah doesn't say anything. The only thing that the Torah says that happened on the first day of the first month is that the glory of God came to dwell in the tabernacle. To me, that's pretty good. <laughs> And so it makes sense that it makes sense that the Son of God came to dwell tabernacle among us, and we saw His glory on the same day. All right, I'm going to lay off the Christmas now. <laughs> One quick question. Yes. So in Numbers about the two silver trumpets, that was not part of the rush. Rosh Chodesh. Yes, they will. Yeah, they will sound the uh, the trumpets on Rosh Chodesh. Yes, yes. All right. So Exodus 40. So on the first day of the first month, you set up, the, set up the tabernacle. So everything is already built. Now we're arriving at the day, right? Um, verse 3, you shall place the ark of the testimony. So now we're going to go one by one again for the third time. And there's going to be a fourth time also. We're not going to read that one, but we're going to account for everything again. So you should place the ark of the testimony there. And you shall screen the ark with the veil. So you have the veil. So we're going to jump a little bit. Verse 4, the table and the lampstand. You see the, the menorah, the word menorah right under it. And then uh, the, the golden altar of incense. So you're going by, one by one from the inside out. The altar of burnt offering. The laver between the tent of meeting and the altar. And so, and then set up the cord all around. All the covering so that you enclose the, uh, the tabernacle itself. Uh, then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it. And you shall consecrate it. You look at the word consecrate. Kadash. Kadosh, right? Kadosh is holy. Kadash is to make holy, the verb, to sanctify. So you're going to take the anointing oil, you're going to anoint everything, and that's, thus you make it holy. We've talked about the three liquids in Scripture. Water cleanses you from minor uncleanness. Blood cleanses you from real major sin, right? From the, from the sin problem. But oil anoints people to, to be able to enter into the presence of God himself. And so these three uh, uh, liquids, what they do is they, they infuse us with that ever-increasing higher and higher level of holiness, of life. So the water infuses us with life because it's living water. Always in scripture is living water. Same with the blood, right? Leviticus 17.11 says that the blood makes atonement by reason of the life that is in the blood. So the active ingredient of blood is life. So it's all about infuse, an infusion of life. Water infuses us with life. Blood infuses us with life. Oil is the highest level of life being infused on us because it's the one that finally qualifies people to enter into the presence of God. Obviously, at the time, just the high priest, right? Um, and, and the priest who will go into the, the holy place. But, of course, we are all anointed in the Messiah. And so we're able, according to Hebrews, to come into the very presence, the very throne of God's grace, the Holy of Holies. All right, so take the anointing oil, consecrate it all. Uh, and then now it's going to go, oh, it's going to count everything again. We did it from the inside out. Now we're going to start from the outside in. So now we anoint the altar of burnt offering and all the utensils. Um, 
And it says, uh, anointed laver over here. I didn't necessarily highlight it. And then anoint Aaron. Mm -hmm. Right? You should bring Arab, bring Arab close. Look at the word bring. Karaf. We talked about this word when we talked last year about Leviticus. And obviously we're about to get into Leviticus. We get the word Carvenu. We get the word Carvenu. We're going to have an announcement for Carvenu today. Carvenu means draw us near in plural. Karav is singular in third person. So draw him near. So this is near to the presence of God. So bring Aaron into the presence of God and his sons to the doorway of a tent of meeting and wash them with water. Infuse them with life. Right? Uh, you shall put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and sanctify him. Look at the word for anoint. Mashach. Right? We get the word Mashiach. Messiah. The anointed one. Right? Yeah. And then the word Kadash. Consecrate. to Make holy. You shall bring his sons uh, and put the tunics on them and you shall anoint them as well. Um, verse uh, 16 thus Mois Moses did thus Moses did uh, this is what we talked about last week that there, this is the fulfillment report and God said let there be light and it was so yeah. right so here in Exodus and God said let there be a tabernacle build a tabernacle for me and it was so. And it was so. Moses did it according to all that the Lord had commanded him. So he did. Now, in the first month of the second year, on the first day, we're still on that same day. Right? So all, they woke up early in the morning. They anointed everything. Mm -hmm. Now that everything is anointed, now we're going to move to the next level. So, verse 18, Moses erected the tabernacle and laid its sockets and all the boards. We're going to go through all the details here. Put the covering of the tent uh, as the Lord commanded. Then he took the testimony. What is the testimony? The tablets with the Ten Commandments. That's why it's called the Ark of the Testimony. Because the testimony, the tablets, went inside the Ark. Someday we need to stop and slow down and study this word, uh, the testimony, and obviously the Ten Commandments. So then he took the testimony and put it into the ark and attached the poles to the ark. Uh, he brought in the ark into the tabernacle, set, it, set up the veil. So now we went all the way inside. We're going to work our way out again, right? So now we're in the Holy of Holies. They brought out the ark, set up the veil. Um, verse 22, and he put the, tab, uh, the table, now the, the table, so we are working, uh, uh, working our way outside. So now we have the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle. North side. Anybody remember? We talked about this last year. The north side. <laughs> it's a place that carries just, a, again, a, a little higher level of holiness little higher level of holiness. We'll talk about that a little bit in, when we start in Leviticus next week. So put the table in the uh, tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle, which is actually, remember, the tabernacle is facing east. So I believe east, where, where's east here? Is it that way? I think it's that way, east. Yeah. By the way, if you think, oh, we're not facing east when we're worshiping and doing a Torah service. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. We're covered. As long as you are facing the Torah, then you're good. Amen. <laughs> we got you covered, we got you covered. So then, uh, he put the, the, the table in the, t in the tent of meeting on the north side. So that would be, if this is east, that will be north, right? So if you're, if you're inside the tent... Uh, you know the altar, of the, the, uh, the altar of incense is right in the middle. So you're going to have to your left, you're going to have the table. And to your right, you're going to have the menorah. 
So that's how it works. Here is the ark, here is the veil. So altar of incense, menorah, and table over there. Uh, verse 23. He said the arrangement of the bread, so we're talking about the table, um, in order in order it, sorry, in order on it before the Lord, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then he placed the lampstand. So now we're, we're the menorah. We're working our way out, right? Um, he lighted the lamps. Now, watch, watch what's happening here. He's starting everything. The bread is finally, there's finally bread. So not only, you know, we started out with the instructions. Then people gave the offerings to build it. Then they finally build it. They woke up that, that day, first day, the first month, and they're setting everything up. Now somebody made the bread. Now the bread is nice and fresh right there. Now somebody went and lighted the lamps. And the lamps are lit. Uh, next we're going to see that he burnt fragrant incense on it. The altar of incense now is functioning. It's working. It is actually pouring out the, the, the fragrant incense on it. Just as the Lord commanded Moses. Then he set up the veil for the doorway of the tent of the tabernacle. So you know you have a veil that covers the ark of the testimony. And then you have another veil that covers the entrance to the holy place. The holy of holies, the holy place. So we're working our way outside. And then verse 29. Then he said the altar of burnt offering. So now we're outside. Uh, before the doorway of the tent of the tabernacle. And offered on it the burnt offering and the meal offering, the grain offering. That's what meal offering means. It's, it's the mincha. You see the word there. Grain offering. That's Leviticus chapter 2. So now there is finally an offering on this altar. This thing is getting going all on the first day of the first month. This is happening now. It's happening. There's an offering on it. Uh, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He placed the laver between the tent uh, and, uh, and the altar. So they washed their hands. It says, from it, Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. We talked about this infusing even more with more and more life, with more and more water. When they enter the tent of meeting and when they approach the altar, they washed just as the Lord had commanded Moses. So he erected the court all around the tabernacle and the altar. And then we finally says, thus Moses finished the work. What's going to happen now? Now everything is set up. Now everything is set up for the glory to come down. For the presence of God, for the cloud. Verse 34, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Remember? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. And we saw his glory. The first day of the first month. The first day of Nisan. So, it is so thick that it says Moses was not able to enter. Could not enter. So thick was the glory in the cloud. What do you think that means? Because, you know, I, mean, I just think like walking into a fog in that case. But well, what is so thick that he can't get in? I grew up in East Tennessee, and there's, there's hills and mountains. And uh, Tornwell sings about uh, the hills and mountains in a song. Um, and it's likened to that song, but... Um, when I got my driver's license, I had to literally pull over to the side of the road. It's one thing to drive in it, and it's another thing to ride in it. My father taught me how to drive. Um, I felt safe when I rode with him, but when I started to drive, I had to pull over. The fog mm -hmm. was so thick, mm -hmm. my dad would say, you can't cut it with a butter knife. <laughs> um, he, was a Viet he, he was a Vietnam vet, but he served in the Army and the Navy, um, we drove in it. I could not drive in it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't seasoned. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Even now, when I take my daughter back, um, I still have to pull over. It's so thick. You can't, you can't see it. Mm-hmm. And that's during the day. Uh, so when it's so thick that the water literally creates so much condensation from the lake, you walk in it and you're literally drenched. Mm-hmm. I don't see that here in the uh, Right. I right. See it in well, we have we have too much sun here in Texas, right? <laughs> it's going to dissipate all of that stuff. But I, I think of I think of the darkness. To put it in contrast, the darkness that fell upon Egypt. It was so thick. Um, it, it, they could feel it. Um, so, yeah. So the presence of God is so was so thick. Remember. The, he uses the cloud to hide himself. Yes. Right. Yes. This is the purpose of actually the incense as well. When on Yom Kippur, if you read carefully on Yom Kippur, the priest, the high priest would, would actually, as he was ent- as he, before entering into the Holy of Holies, he will burn incense inside the, the Holy of Holies and the whole uh, the whole room was filled with the cloud. And the reason God gives is, I don't want you to die. <laughs> That's the reason. I don't want you to die. And so, because God is present there, it's, it's the old um, idea that we read in Scripture over and over again. If you see God, you will die. And so God is saying, I, I don't want you to see me directly. Make a cloud so that you can Amen. be covered in a, in a sense. And, and when, you read, when you read Leviticus 16, it, it's almost, a, it's almost a, a, a detail that it doesn't register much with us. But it is there and, and, and it gives the purpose for it so that, so that you wouldn't die. That's... that's uh, this is also comparable to the levels of holiness. We've talked a little bit about, even now, about the different liquids in Scripture, right? Water cleanses you from minor uncleanness. Blood takes it a higher level. And oil anoints you so that you're able to enter the presence of God. So they're all different levels of holiness, different levels of being infused with life. And the, the same applies to the, the revealed glory of God. There are different levels. Uh, different intensity of his presence. Right? He, to, he told Moses, I'm going to show you my back. Yeah. You can't stand to see my face. <laughs> and yet we're... We, and when we enter the presence of God in the Hebrew, it's being before his face. So there is a, this is, these are degrees of intensity. These are not uh, Western categories. In, in the Western mindset, it's either there or not. Right? It's yes or no. It's black or white. But in, in the Hebraic mindset... It flows. These are, these are degrees of my glory and degrees of my presence that I'm going to allow you to, to experience. So, he's not able to enter. We're going to conclude with, with a, little, a little hint over here, right? You're going to laugh. So, we have a report about the cloud. It says, you know, throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud would not, was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. Uh, throughout their journeys, keep talking about the cloud, the day of nine, and then the Torah doesn't stop. The Torah keeps going, and it says, then the Lord called Moses from where? From the cloud, from the Holy of Holies. Right? He couldn't enter, and then the Lord called him. 
And he says, and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, and voila, you're in Leviticus. <laughs> Welcome to Leviticus. <laughs> If you don't know why these people are laughing, <laughs> I'll let you in. <laughs> let you into the insider joke here. Uh, I have a nickname. My nickname is the Leviticus Nerd. <laughs> and so for me, Leviticus is the back, the, the Torah is the backbone of scripture. Leviticus is the nerve system. It touches everything. And without this system, you wouldn't know that you hurt your little toe when you were walking around your bed and that it hurts really bad. And it could be bleeding, could be broken, and you wouldn't know. It's the nerve system that touches everything, Amen. that puts everything in context. So that's why we can read John 1. And we see his glory. He tabernacled. He came to dwell. And we're like, oh, this is a great verse. Awesome. Yeah. But we don't see the connection to the tabernacle. Right? We need Leviticus for that. So Leviticus is the nerve system. I'm not saying the nerd system. <laughs> I'm saying the nerve system. Right? <laughs> but really... Um, why do we talk about the glory and holiness? Because when the glory of God fills the temple, you and me, then we're filled with the Spirit. And when we're filled with the Spirit, it changes our identity. Yes. Yes. It changes our perspective. Yes. It changes what we do. Amen. Mm -hmm. This is God's preferred method of transformation. Amen. Yes. Yes. That you and I be exposed to his glory. Amen. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Son of God. So that we may be transformed into his image. Yes. Amen. That's why we do what we do as Sukkot. Amen. That's why being in the presence of God, for each one of us to have an encounter with God, is, is number one priority. Amen. And so, we invite the presence of God every Shabbat to be with us, to be among us, to move among us, to be a cloud, to, to be so thick, right? But it is as thick as our individual level of holiness is. Right? So we fill up. We don't come here to to just to receive. We come here to add to the glory and to their level of holiness because of our walk. Right? Because of our closet experience with the glory of God in the presence of God. Um, scripture says that the woman is the glory of man. So we sanctify our wives. You can't give what you don't have. So you need to be sanctified. So you can sanctify your wife. So you're the glory, like with Moses, that shines that emanates when you come from your time in, in Scripture and in the Word and in the presence of God, 
it sanctifies all of those around you. Amen. Right? So we don't talk about the glory of God without discerning really who we're talking about and what are we talking Amen. about. Amen. Amen. Amen.